Well, thank you so much, guys. What a, what a blessing to be here. And uh, we came down, uh, what's today, Sunday? Uh, we came down on Friday and uh, flew. We were flying from Orlando into uh, Columbus. And uh, we got about halfway here. We left Orlando, got about halfway here. The pilot came over the uh, loudspeaker and he said, uh, well, we're having some problems with some of the instruments on the, on the uh, plane. Uh, we don't think it'll make us crash. Um, uh, we don't think it's, it's life-threatening, but uh, we are going to turn around and go back to Orlando. We were already about a half, halfway here, an hour into the flight, and a lady, she uh, heard the information, and she went crazy, and she uh, had a panic attack, and she thought the plane was going down. She thought we were going to crash, and, and so we got back, and, and finally, they, they were using the lady's excuse as to why we had to turn around and go back instead of the fact of airplane failure, which is why we left late anyways. I mean, y'all just like flying, amen? Just love flying. Uh, Kay's daddy often said, he said, I'm not afraid of flying, it's crashing that scares me to death. And, uh, but anyways, we're glad to be here. Can I just say thank you, Pastor, and thank you to uh, Fellowship Baptist Church for taking in our son. If he wasn't here, I'd have to be feeding him and paying to uh, uh, pay to feed him and take care of him. But uh, you're here, he's here, and with y'all. And uh, the addition of our new daughter-in-law uh, was a tremendous blessing. Kayla's a sweetheart, and we love her. And uh, it's hard. It's for a guy, for us men, for us dads. It's easier. I think it's easier to kind of give our sons away. Uh, we have three boys and one girl, and there's no man good enough for my daughter. But my son, I, I was more than willing to uh, let Kayla have him and take him. And, uh, but for mom, it was hard. She was like, that's my baby. Uh, I don't want to get rid of him. So I'm glad. God blessed me as well because I only have to pay for three rehearsal dinners and one wedding. Amen. <laughs> so the Lord is good. But uh, it's great to be here. And I, I want to just take a, a little bit of time. Uh, I don't want to preach you out this morning. Pastor's going to come and preach in just a minute, but uh, we are delighted to be here, and thank you for the hospitality. And, and uh, my wife and I have been in ministry 26 years together. We started in October 1987 in Orlando, Florida, where we're currently living. It's amazing sometimes how life kind of brings you back around to the same spot. But we had been uh, the last 10 years in North Carolina, pastoring a church there, and God let us see some great days, some good days, went through a major building project, about a million point six Family Life Center, and just some great days, but, but if you're not careful, even in the midst of the great days, sometimes Satan can get in, and that's one of the things that we experienced. Uh, if you don't keep your eyes on the Lord, if you don't keep your focus in the direction and the places they should be, sometimes Satan can come and he can take that which is sown and catch it away, and he can even take something that is bitter or painful or bad and put it in, and, and I think sometimes God allows him to see uh, where we are at, where we are at spiritually. So this morning, I'm very grateful. God's done some amazing things in our life, and uh, I just want to uh, encourage you today, and I want to give you a thought. I've, I've really struggled with which direction to go, but I feel like the Lord had me tell you this and sh- share some things with you. So I want you to take your Bible and go with me to Luke 16, Luke 16. And I want to give you just a little phrase. I was driving down the road one day. My boys played golf. I know uh, you would look at Tyler and say, why did you ever have Tyler playing golf? Well, number one, he could hit the golf ball about 320 yards. Uh, just you didn't know everywhere it was going to go. Uh, it was uh, it was a long way, but sometimes it was in the short grass, sometimes it was in the tall grass. But but instead of playing golf, I probably should have had him playing linebacker or tight end at six three and a half, two hundred and fifty five, two hundred sixty pounds. And and I didn't tell him this, but a long time ago he could have whooped me. Uh, I didn't tell him this. I, I never wanted him to know because I was afraid uh, sometimes. But I, I always had one advantage over him. He had to go to sleep sometime. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but he, he's, he's been a great son, but my boys have played golf. My, my second son is 19. He's at Liberty University and he plays golf on the golf team there. And, and, uh, and so golf has been a part of our life. I'm a horrible golfer. Hudson probably, he hit his, his first hole in one when he was 12. Tyler hit his first hole in one, I think he was about 15. And, uh, and I've just never been that great of a golfer. Uh, but I've traveled with them from place to place. Uh, taking him to golf tournaments, and one day we were listening to XM Radio, and it was the Golf Channel, we were listening to some particular tournament, and a guy said something that, that really stuck into my heart and into my life, and it really made sense to me, and here's what he said. He said, it's not what you know, but what you do with what you know that makes a difference. 
And, and as I was driving down the road that day, I just thought, man, that makes sense. There's a lot of guys who know how to hit a golf ball. But it's what you do with the abilities that you have gained. It's what you do with what you know, how you utilize it. Have you ever heard the term, maybe if you are, are golfers, course management? How you maneuver your way around the course, apply it to life. It's not just what you know about life, but it's what you do with what you know that makes a difference. Somebody else said this. They said, um, I'm not going to remember it. They said, it's uh, not only what you know, what you do with what you know, but if you always do what you've always done, then you'll always get what you've already got. You believe that? And so some of these things have really shaped my life, and I've been thinking about them over the last several years. And, and I came to this Luke 16 passage that I want to read quickly because I've got some things that I want to share with you. But I want you to hold a couple of these thoughts in your mind. It's not only what you know, but what you do with what you know. Was it Fred Kirk? Is Fred in the back? It's Fred back there, Fred Kirk. I met Fred here a moment ago as uh, we were getting ready to uh, begin service today, and Fred said, I was there at the first service. He said, as a matter of fact, Pastor Denoff came, and I was the first house that he called on. And we went to the service there in elementary school, and a couple of months later, I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I thought, isn't that incredible? All these years. And now Pastor Tony is here still building upon that same foundation and doing great things for God. But let me tell you this, it's not just what you know. We know that soul winning's right. We know that living right is right. We know that, that living for God is right. We know that men ought to lead, and we know that we ought to pray, and we know that we ought to do all these, read our Bible, all these things. But the reality is it's what you do with the things that you know that's going to shape your life. And it's if you always keep doing the same thing that you've always done, then you're always going to have what you've already got. There's nothing gonna, never going to be anything new. Let me give you something here. In Luke 16, beginning in verse number 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Pastor used a phrase last night at dinner. He's, he used the phrase Mac Daddy. I, think, I don't know if you remember that, but that's what I call in Luke 16, 19, the Mac Daddy of the New Testament. He was dressed in purple. It wasn't just a purple polo, but he had, he had the nicest, the choicest. The Scripture says he fared sumptuously every day. He had it going on. The Scripture goes on to say, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Do you get the picture here? Here's a rich man. We don't even know his name, but he's got it everything. He's got it all. He, he's doing well. And then there's Lazarus. The Bible tells us his name, who's not doing as good. On the outward, outward appearance, you would say, well, the rich man's doing really good, and Lazarus is not doing well at all. But quite the contrary is true. Because it's not just what's on the outside that matters, right? It's what's on the inside. So look at what the Scripture says. And it says in um, verse 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. It reminds me of, of a scripture in Hebrews. It's appointed unto man once to die, doesn't it? It says that. We're all going to die. So it goes on, they both died, and, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this between you, us and you is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into the place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though, though one rose from the dead. I want you to look at verse number 30 and the last few words of verse number 30 and tell me who is saying these words, the rich man. And notice what he says, they will repent. 
Isn't it something that he learned very quickly what it was that was required to be able to avoid the place that he was in order to go to the place that he wanted to be? He couldn't do anything about it. It was too late for him. But isn't it also amazing that he, now knowing, remembering that he had five brothers, wanted somebody to go and tell his brothers, lest they come to that place also. I want to tell you, if there's ever a time to have a burden for somebody, it's now. If there's ever a time to care about the eternal destiny of somebody, whether they be a loved one or whether they be a neighbor or whether they be a co-worker, it's now. Because the reality is there's coming a day when it's going to be too late. Thus, I, I want to remind you of the statement, it's not only what you know, but it's what you do with what you know that will change your life. There's just a simple thought that I, I, I want to share with you in a couple of scriptures, and I'll really be done. It amazes me, in this room right here, you can take <clears throat> the number of men that are in here, and every one of you, after this time is over, that we have sat together and we have, we have listened to God's Word and we've listened to some thoughts, we will all take something different from this setting. I, I would like to believe, and I trust you believe, that the Holy Spirit of God is able to speak to you in the needs of your life, right where you sit, whatever you're going through, whatever the needs are of your life. I'm sure, Pastor, you have experienced it as well. I'll be at the back door on a Sunday morning service, and, and I'll be standing there with my wife, and we'll be shaking people's hands, and they'll come by and they'll say, Pastor, thank you for preaching on such and such. And I'm thinking, I didn't preach on that today. Thank you for saying that, because God really spoke to my heart. And I'm thinking, I, that's not even what I was intending to say. I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't recollect that I said anything like that. But the sweet Holy Spirit of God Amen. knew their need, and when the Word of God was preached, He began to bring conviction into their heart. He began to sp speak to a, an area of their life where they were struggling. I want to tell you something, only God can do that because God knows the needs of your life. Amen. God knows what you need. You can take a classroom of students, same teacher, same lesson, same homework. I mean, the same stuff, and some students pass and some students fail. Why is that? Same teacher, same lesson, same notes, same homework. The, I think the difference is in the application because it's the same stuff. You know, we have one Bible. My son was talking to me the other day, and, and we were talking about the Mormon, the Mormon faith. Uh, some bumper sticker the other day said, don't blame me, I voted for the Mormon. Um, you'll get that maybe somewhere. But uh, we were talking about the, the, Mormon, the Mormon faith, and, and I said, you know, isn't it amazing that what Satan does many times is he takes, he takes something that is, that is true, and he adds something to it or tries to add something to it that is, that is not true, and therefore it has some truth but it has a mixture of, of lies and heresy with it, and that's where you got to be careful. So when the Mormons or, or, or those people would use the King James Version of the Bible, you would say, well, that sounds really good. But the problem is they've got another Bible. It's that Joseph Smith revelation that scares me, right? Because it's that additional revelation. You Wait a minute. When God gave us his word and it was completed, God gave us all that we needed for eternity. Amen. Thy word, O Lord, is settled in heaven forever. So, what do you know this morning? What do you know about the Word of God? What do you know? What do you know? And what does God want you to know about His Word? A couple of things quickly. The rich man knew what to do. Isn't it something? Verse number 30 said, they will repent. It, the rich man knew that it was repentance that was required, that was necessary to avoid the place that he was. Oh, if someone could just go and tell my brothers they could, they could avoid this place. Isn't it amazing that he knew what to do? But he never did it. He never took the time. Maybe like many people, he thought he had more time, right? Like the rich, the, the, the rich young guy who had, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull down these barns. I'm going to build some bigger barns. Thou fool. What about the rich man? How did the rich man get to this place? He thought he had more time. He knew some things to do, but he didn't do them. He maybe rejected the message. I tell you the truth. Of the 1,400 plus people that came here last Sunday, they were probably, wouldn't you say, some people, did they hear the truth preached, yes or no? Yeah, they did. But you know what they did? They chose to walk out these doors rejecting the truth. 
And I want to tell you, when we look at people like that and we're not moved to tears and we don't have compassion upon them, something's wrong with us. Because they're walking out possibly into an eternity, separated from God forever. The worst part about hell is not the fact that it's going to be eternal torment and flame. I get that. But the worst part about hell is it's going to be eternity separated from God forever. God created us in the beginning, the scripture said, that we might have fellowship with him, that we might enjoy the the fellowship and relationship with him. And God wants us to have a relationship with him. But I want to tell you today, God wants a relationship not only with the lost, he wants a relationship with the saved. He wants a relationship with you every single day of your life. You know what I've learned since resigning my church? I've learned to thank God for meeting our needs every single day. How many of you know when the wife gets the food ready, you go out to eat and you bow your heads and you pray and say, thank you, Lord, for the food. Let's eat. Rub-a-dub-dub. Let's eat. Amen. You know, and I, I say this because this is what the Lord's taught me. When I when I've thanked the Lord for the food that he's given me the last 18 months, it's become significant. My last paycheck was September was, uh, was, I resigned September 30th, but the church had me through the end of the year, December 31st, 2012. And I want to tell you something. God has been so faithful to us. And he's taught me things in, tw- in the 26 years of ministry that I don't think I would have ever learned had I not gone through what I've just come through, what I'm coming through now. So I'm grateful. So some things that I knew have been reshaped and remolded, and now it's changing my life, and it's making me live in a different way. I want to tell you, you can sit in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and if all you're ever doing is hearing, and as James says, not being a doer, you are wasting the most precious opportunity that God's given to you. Thank God to have a pastor who will get up and preach the Word of God unashamedly and say, folks, this is the real deal. This is what it's all about. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. How about, let's start on Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man that walketh not on the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but what? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he, what? Meditate day and night. I learned this from from another preacher. He said it, it stuck in my mind. God does not bless Bible readers. God blesses Bible meditators, right? So what does that mean? It's one thing just to get up and have your devotions and read, well, I read chapter one of Proverbs. Yeah, but do you meditate on it? Do you think about it? Do you like a cow chewing its cud? Do you let it permeate your heart and your mind and your life? Don't just say, well, I I read my couple of chapters today. Did you meditate on it? Blessed Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt what? Meditate there in day and night. Listen, if preacher was to get up and ask you next Sunday morning, what did he preach about this Sunday morning? I wonder how many of you can remember any points of the message. Or is it just, we did church, we got our three points in a poem, let's go. The reality is, God wants to give you something that will last for your every day, all throughout the day. So that you might be spiritually fed and you might be hungry. And by the way, it's not just the pastor's job to feed you spiritually. It's your job to feed you spiritually. He's going to feed you. He's going to give you something from the word of the Lord. But don't come in here. Somebody said seven days without God makes one week. Yeah. Because if you go seven days without any infusion of the word, the word of God into your life, you're going to be pretty weak spiritually. So you can know Psalm 1-1. You can know that it says, blessed is the man that walketh not on the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You can know that evil, those evil companionships and those evil associations are going to corrupt you and they're going to bring you down. In the process, simply standing, walking, sitting, you see the, you see the progression. It, it's a, a lack of momentum. But then meditating on God's word day and night is something that every one of us need to know. But we need to do it because what you know will affect what you do if you make it, if you make it applicable in your life. Look at, look at another thought, and that is, if you write down Psalm 37.4, Psalm 37.4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall what? Give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37.4 says, delight, 
enjoy, take your life, wrap it around that which God wants for your life. Delight thyself in the Lord. Delight in what God's doing in your life. Delight in the victories that God's working and bringing into your life. Delight, rejoice. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. I'm going to tell you this, if your desires are wrong, God can change them. Because you'll want what he wants for your life. I'm going to tell you this, I'm, I'm living witness, and I hope you are too. I want, what, I want all of what God has for my life. Amen. I want to do everything that God has for my life. That's one of the reasons why I'm standing here today and not in North Carolina, because I don't want to get sidetracked by people's agenda. I want to get in on God's agenda. I want to get in on God's plan. I want to be accountable to God. What does God want for my life? Listen, if you let people, they'll hold you back from what God wants you to do. And what a shame when we stand before the Lord. You're not going to give an account to some group of people. You're going to give an account to Almighty God. You're going to stand there and give an account. There's coming a judgment day. And if God's put it in your heart to do, don't let anybody kill your dream. Do what God has told you to do. And by the way, he's given us some, mar some marching orders, right? He's given us the desire to want to please him. So I say, you and yourself. How about this? Another verse. Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. The scripture says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You can know that till the cows come home. But unless you guard and protect and keep your heart, your heart may wander off into some pastures that it has no business being. My mom attends a church in South Florida. You may know the pastor. His name is Bob Coy. 20,000 people started the church 25 years ago. Started the church down in Fort Lauderdale and uh, had nothing, had seven or eight people. Now 20,000 people, 1,000 employees. And about two or three weeks ago, he had to get up in front of the the board of, of, of uh, leadership of his church, and he had to resign because he had an adulterous affair. Do you know what? It sickens my heart, number one, because my mom was going to church there, and she had such confidence in that man. And I know, well, we shouldn't have confidence in man, but you know what? It's a natural thing to have confidence in your pastor. It's a natural thing. He's your leader. He's God's man. So it's a natural thing. And you know what? Listen, does, is he worthy? Is he deserving of a second chance? You better believe it. Amen. Because the Bible tells us when a brother is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, we're to help restore him. Amen. Now, he may not be able to have that same position. You know, listen, that's another whole message, but here's the thought. Men, if we don't guard and protect our hearts, we're doing ourselves much harm. Guard and protecting your heart means when I moved to, to Graham, North Carolina, uh, we were driving down Interstate 40 every single day, and there were billboards up of the strip club down the road up in the next city over, and I thought, my goodness, I've got to raise my boys here with all these half-naked ladies on these billboards, and at 16 and 15 and 14, they've got to see this filth and trash every day when we drive by, down the road. Thankfully, group of pastors got together, myself included, and we were able to close down those strip clubs Amen. with God's help. And I was so grateful when those billboards came down because I didn't want that junk going into my, my mind, my son's mind. You know why? Because I need to guard and protect my heart. I can know what to do, but it's what you do with what you know that's going to protect you. It's going to save you. Let me give you a couple of more and I'm done. Romans 10, 13. I love this one. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. You can know that, but I'm going to tell you, just mental assent to a fact isn't going to change your life. But I want to tell you this, if you're here today and you do not know Christ, calling upon the Lord, he'll save you. He'll give you everlasting life. A lot of people know that. A lot of people know that God, you know, died on the cross and all, but they, they understand that. You know what? To put your complete faith and trust in him and him alone. It's all of grace, or it's not grace at all. He saved you. He wants to save you. He wants to change your life and give you new life. One last verse, James 4, 17. I love it. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It uses the very word we're talking about today. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him or her it's sin. 
the reality is you can know what to do. You can, you, can have, you can be a Sunday school teacher, you can be a deacon, you can be a, you can be a vacuumer here in the church, you can, be a, you can be a musician, you can be a choir member, you can be anything. But if you know what to do, and you don't apply it to your life, and you don't put those principles to your life, and, and, and apply them to your life the right way, I'm going to tell you something, it'll just be words, it'll just be a regular routine. You know, I, I, I've only been around your pastor for a little bit, but I like his spirit. And I like, I like the things that he's saying. And from the little bit of time that we've gotten together, he doesn't just want Fellowship Baptist Church to be another Baptist church. Amen. He wants this place to be all that God wants it to be. And I'm going to tell you something. You men, with what you know, and applying what you know with the God-given leadership and with a vision and a burden from God, there's no telling what God can do. Next year, it could be 2,000 for Easter Sunday. So oh, it's, it's not a number. It's not about a number. But I'll tell you this, every number represents a soul. Amen. If we ever lose sight of that. So it's not only what we know, but it's what we do with what we know. It's not, if, if we always do what we've always done, then we'll always have what we've already got. So... Let's ask God to help us. The rich man, he knew what to do. It was too late. His brothers, what, what was said to them? No, they've got Moses and the prophets. They've got the word, right? They've got what they need. If they won't hear them, they won't hear one, though he raised from the dead and go and tell them. You know why? Because the word of God is sufficient. Amen. Every thing and everything and for all things the word of God is sufficient I saw a YouTube clip the other day of some Bibles being passed out in China I, evidently they were smuggled in to uh, to a house and I'm assuming that within this house there were some there was there were some believers who were meeting in an underground service having having had these Bibles smuggled in the lady goes over to the case and she rips the top of the case open and these believers from all over the room they make a mad dash for that case and they grabbed one of the Bibles out of that case and they began to kiss it and they began to cry and weep so thankful and so grateful for a copy of God's word that they were moved with tears you know a long time ago somebody told me don't ever put anything on top of your Bible. Don't ever put any. I don't throw keys on my Bible. I don't throw my phone on my Bible. I don't throw any other books on my Bible. If my Bible is near my proximity and I can help it, there's nothing on top of my Bible because I don't, there's nothing more important than God's Word. I want to challenge you today. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. And let God speak to your heart come to the house of God with an excitedness, with an anticipation of what is God going to do in my heart today? Because there's some things that I need to know, and then I need to take what I know and do something with it. Oh, man, I pray that God will help us. Pray that God will encourage y'all. I'm encouraged just by being here amongst you today. So may I challenge you with that thought. The rich man, he knew what to do, but it was too late. Lazarus, though he didn't have much, he was able to be comforted because he, he took the time to do something about what he knew.